In this lecture, we're going to look at our first voting paradox. This is the so-called Condorcet paradox. So recall Condorcet's idea. His idea is that when we're given the data from a particular election, so we're given the preferences of, among, of a bunch of voters. So in this case, there's 21 voters. Each of these voters rank the four candidates in a linear ordering, so they give a strict ordering over all of the candidates. Um, and those orderings are divided into four groups, as you see in this, uh, this table right here. Now, Condorcet had the idea that candidate C should be declared the winner in this election, and the reason for that is that candidate C beats every other candidate in a head-to-head -head election. So when we compare candidate C with, for example, candidate A, we see that C ends up with 13 votes and eight people rank A above C. So 13 people rank C above A, but only eight people rank A above C. So C beats A in a head-to-head -head election. Versus B, candidate B gets 10 votes, so 10 people rank B above C, while 11 people rank C above B. And finally, against D, C beats D 14 to 7. So 14 people rank C above D, but only 7 people rank D above C. So C should be declared the winner. But we can continue this process. We can continue with this idea and we can say, well, okay, who comes in second? So remove C con from consideration and ask in this smaller without considering C, who now beats every other candidate, every other remaining candidates in a head-to-head -head election. So we see that B will be ranked second. Why is that? Well, B, 13 people rank B over A, but only eight people rank A over B. Against D, everybody ranks B above D. So it's unanimous that everybody prefers, strictly prefers B over D. So B is ranked second because B beats both A and D in a head-to-head -head election. And then finally, we just have to ask which of D and A win against in a head-to-head -head election. And we see that eight people rank A above D while 13 rank D above A. So the overall ordering is that C comes in first, B comes in second, D comes in third, and A comes in last. And we can define an ordering over the candidates that's, that's derived or defined in terms of this majoritarian idea. So the idea is that C is ranked, so we say C is greater than or equal, greater than sub M, meaning this just means that a majority of people in the election rank C strictly above B. So to give ourselves some notation to express this, suppose that X and Y are two candidates and P sub I represents voter I's strict preference. Then I'm going to write this boldface N of XPY just in case the number of individuals, the number of voters, I'm going to let N of XPY stand for the number of voters that rank stri X strictly above Y. So these absolute value signs here, these, these bars, stand for the number of elements in this set right here. So this is the set of all voters that rank X strictly above Y, and the bars around it mean count the number of elements in this set. So N of XPY stands for the number of voters that rank X strictly above Y. And we're going to say that X is at least as good as Y according to this group majoritarian relation or the Condorcet relation, just in case the number of people that rank X above Y is greater than or equal to the number of people that rank Y above X. So that's just to say that a majority prefers X over Y. So the reason I'm writing greater than or equal to here is that our population might have an even number of people in that. And then it's quite possible that exactly half of the population ranks X above Y and the other half ranks Y above X, in which case the, these two numbers will actually be equal. So we would say that X and Y have equal support in the, in the society. X is said to be a Condorcet winner if X beats every other candidate in a head-to-head -head election. So taking into account the fact that there may be ties, the way we express that is we say there's no other candidate Y 
such that that candidate, rest strictly more people prefer that candidate over X. So candidate X is maximal in this, this particular ordering right here. On the flip side, we can also talk about the Condorcet loser. So X is a Condorcet loser if X loses to every other candidate in a head-to-head -head election. So there's no other candidate Y such that there are strictly more people that prefer X over Y than Y over X. So this is our notation. The goal of this notation was just simply to define this majority relation or the Condorcet relation. So what's the problem? The problem is as follows. This relation does not have the properties that we want it to have. So let me illustrate. Suppose that we have just three voters. So voter one, voter two, and voter three. And there's three candidates. And the voters hold these preferences. So voter one strictly prefers candidate A over B over C, voter two C over A over B, and voter three B over C over A. And so now we can ask, does the group prefer A over B? Well, what I'm asking is, is it the case that A is ranked above B according to this majority relation, or that B is ranked above A according to this majority relation, or perhaps A is equal to B according to this majority relation. Uh, well, that won't happen because we have an odd number of voters and we're, and we're not allowing ties, um, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, so does the group prefer A over B? Well, it's easy to see that two people prefer A over B, so it's two to one A over B. So yes, the answer is yes. A is ranked above B. What about B over C? Well, again, we can see that voter one and voter three strictly prefer B over C, while voter two prefers C over B. So it's two to one that B should be ranked above C. So in a situation where A is ranked above B, B is ranked above C. And what should we conclude? Well, if the relation was transitive, we should have A is ranked above C. So that's the question. Is our relation transitive? Well, in fact, it's not transitive because a majority of people actually prefer A over C. So voter one Sorry, voter one prefers A over C, but voter two and voter three prefer C over A. So in fact, our majority ordering is not transitive. And this is the Condorcet paradox. The majority relation is not transitive. There's what's called a Condorcet cycle. So a Condorcet cycle is a cycle, uh, an example of intransitivity in the majoritarian relation. So for example, here we see that A is ranked strictly above B, which ranks strictly above C, which is ranked strictly above A, according to this Condorcet ranking. Now, why is this bad? Well, if we take Condorcet's idea and we say who should be declared the winner, well, it can't be candidate A because a majority prefers C over A, but then it can't be candidate C because a majority prefers B over C, but then it can't be candidate B because a majority prefers A over C. B, but we just already said that it can't be candidate A either. So this is Condorcet's paradox. He has a perfectly good idea, but unfortunately there are certain situations in which he just, his, this voting method, this, this idea of how to select the winner just doesn't yield a single winner. So what do we do? The general question is, how bad is this? Is this just, should we give up on group decision making? Should we say, I don't know, okay, now we have to just flip a coin. Well, let's think about this question, how bad it really is. So first of all, it does suggest that the final decisions that people make in a group decision making situation are going to be extremely sensitive to institutional features such as who is arbitrarily setting the agenda, or who is setting the agenda, arbitrary time limits placed on how long you're deliberating about the different issues, who is permitted to make motions, and so on. So to illustrate what I have in mind here, let's, let's take an example. Suppose you're a society and somebody donates $1,000 to your society. So you have $1,000. 
Now, there are three groups in this society, three sort of little subgroups of the society. So group A, group B, and group C. And they each want a piece of the pot. They each want some of this $1,000. So the question is, how do you divide up the $1,000? Well, maybe somebody makes a motion and they say, well, let's divide it up evenly. Okay, so what that means is that, let's say group A gets 333 and a third dollars. Group B gets 333 and a third dollars. And group C gets 333 and a third dollars. So the, the ordering here is A, B, and C. This is how much money A, B, and C get. So this is our first way of distributing up the money. So you offer this as a motion. And then somebody else, maybe somebody from uh, group B or group A says, well, how about we divide it this way? Let's say give $500 to group A, $500 to group B, and $0 to group C. That's another possible distribution of, of wealth. So you throw that on the table. Well, would this would you allow this motion to to be brought up to vote well a and b the groups a and b and let's assume that the the size of the groups they have equal power uh, both a and b prefer distribution two over distribution one of course i'm ignoring any sense of overall fairness that people in the group might might have uh, and they're just taking sort of self-interest into account so both groups A and B prefer D2 over D1. Okay, so group C, somebody from group C, because they do very poorly in this distribution, they say, well, I have an idea. How about a third distribution? Namely, group A is given $700, group B is given $0, but group C gets $300. So this is the third way of distributing the money. Well, will this motion be brought up to a vote? Well, yeah, because A would prefer this, this way of distributing it, because A ends up with more money, but C also ends up with more money. So A and C would prefer D3 over D2. So we have a majority prefers D1 over D2, and a majority prefers D2 over D3, but now when we hold an election, it's unclear what's going to happen because a majority, namely B and C, actually prefer the original D1 distribution over D3. So what will actually happen, how the money will get divided, will depend on arbitrary features of the deliberation. When you stop deliberating, which of these possible distributions is actually being voted on and so on. So that's one. So this is sort of the... the how bad it might be. This is why Condorcet's paradox might lead to instability and, and sort of arbitrariness in some group decisions. But a second, an important question that needs to be asked is, is the Condorcet paradox just something that us philosophers and, and theoreticians just came up with? Is it something that is bad theoretically, but in practice, we don't, we've never actually bumped up against an example of a situation where there was a genuine Condorcet cycle. So I'm not going to get into this issue. I just want to point you to two books, uh, one by uh, William Riker and the, the other by Mackey. And they take sort of opposite sides of the debate. So Riker argues that we have in fact seen a number of examples of the Condorcet paradox showing up in real life elections, whereas Mackey looks at some of these examples and argues that the, the paradox doesn't actually show up. So you, you need to do some political science, some history to, to determine and, and reconstruction of possible preferences, to determine whether or not there were actual real life examples of the Condorcet paradox. But we still could think a bit more theoretically about it. We could ask another question, which is related. We could just say, well, maybe the Condorcet paradox does happen, but it's very, very unlikely. If there's a large number of voters, large number of candidates, or even a small number of candidates, maybe it's very unlikely that we would actually see a Condorcet paradox. 
So this is an interesting question, which we'll take up in the next lecture.